coming out here, I realized, and I still have it, when, on the beginning, people would say, like, you can't make it. None of us Tongans would be able to do it. But I'm looking around, like, I hang out with a bunch of Tongans that does make it. They're making a lot, a lot of money off doing it, you know? <laughs> now, what are you guys talking about? But I think it's just that mindset that they bring that pawn. They feel like they, they're not part of it. They, they feel like you're doing better than them, then they want to pull you down so you guys can sit on the same pawn. Mr. Siausi Lange, <laughs> the Prince of Tonga. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Right? Like your dad was the chief, and I looked it up saying, all right, if you're if your dad's the chief, what what do they call the son? And it said Prince. <laughs> well, I think the title that my dad had was called uh Ofisakolo. Ofisakolo. Uh, so maybe I should clear this out. So there's the the kings. And there's the higher chief, and higher chief has a visa call to take care of the body of the, the community. Okay. So an officer call runs the voice of the, the community to the chiefs, the higher chiefs, to the king, yeah. basically. So if a, if a chief and officer call don't get along, it's usually a chaos in that community. <laughs> <laughs> right. But if the officer call and the higher chief has a way of um, negotiating in a lot of things than the community. For example, if there is a, usually when a king has a wedding, yeah, everybody chip in. All right. Everybody <laughs> is chipping in whatever they have. And usually the higher the chief to the king or closer the chief to the king, they provide yeah. more than the lesser chief. <laughs> so the chief and the town uh, and the officer Kolo work hand in hand, how they can be able to accommodate to what the, um, the kings need right. as far as because we are basically living in their land is what they their land yeah, yeah so we're gonna talk what, about that. <laughs> you were telling me about opportunities <laughs> <laughs> so i think i grew up it was wasn't even a, a healthy way of saying it. a lot of people did not like that concept of or somebody telling them what to do in a way. Yeah. So when my dad became the officer Kolo, he changed a lot of things. He's he was a bishop for almost seven years. Okay. So he brought in a lot of uh, ways. Let's just say uh, the American way, the Western way. Right. There's a community. I've noticed in America here there is communities for women. There's communities for men. There's community for kids. There's community for everything. And all these communities decide what they can do to grow or to improve those areas. And they just come to him and he just sits there and like, listen, you know, listen to everybody reports, see what they propose that would help. And they decide from it. But in the past, whatever the officer Kolo would say, flows. Whatever the chief, the higher chief would say, flows. Everybody does it. So that was a major change. And I feel like that was a very good influence as part of um, the Western world in our community. Man, you're kind of what you're describing is like a dictatorship. Yes. And you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> so then your dad started making some changes on that. You thought that was pretty awesome. Yeah. And then uh, after your dad passed away, what did you say it was about a year and a half into it? Yeah. Then all of a sudden they kind of slid back and reverted back to the good old ways of more yeah. of a dictatorship. Is what yeah. You're um, it, it more so people will always go back to our natural way of doing things. Yeah. If there isn't um, a consistent way of leading it in that way, um, that basically that idea will basically die out in a way. Um, unfortunately enough, he didn't live enough and, and, and push this concept long enough that it sticks. Um, I haven't heard of what happened at home right now, but that's one of the things that I've noticed is that people need a leader like that. Um, and what I find that if what my dad did, he gives out all these, uh, responsibility. Yeah. The community feel that they are part of the community now. That's a huge part in my, in my, you know, like I say, if you're running a company and if you give, if you're like basically just telling your co your workers to do this every single day, eventually they'll like resent or they'll get tired of what you're telling them. But if you give them a sense of responsibility, Hey, you're in charge of this part of the, you know, of the job, right. you know, 
they feel like it's their, you know, they feel like a, a more sense of like responsibility to actually achieve and make it or to show you that he can do it, you know? And that's why I feel like it's a good way to run anything, a community, uh, in business. And I do it a lot. A lot of times when I do my, my, uh, run my business, I always hire people and I ask them like, what do you think of this situation? Their feedback, we we work on what they're what they're telling me that have worked for them, or what I've seen that work for me, and usually those projects will go smoother and a lot better than normal. Because then they're working hard because they took part of creating that idea to get the job done. You've seen that in a lot of places. Yeah, where all of a sudden you uh, you chip in and have a piece of the action, <laughs> then you feel like you're contributing, then you feel like you actually take ownership of it. Yeah, that um. Like one of the things that I think you had kind of mentioned is, is like, I mean, the reality is, is you probably could have stayed in Tonga. You probably could have chased your dad's footsteps and maybe become a chief, but you decided not to. Mm-hmm. You decided to make a move and you came and you came to America. Like what, what was, what was the, what was the big allure, the big draw that brought you on or brought you to come here then? Uh, dreams. The dream. Uh, the dream. Just living the dream. I think as a young age, um, I really we we grew up in like a way different lifestyle than than uh, most teenagers are taught here. We were taught the tough love. We were taught to work hard. Um, That's every, probably a good thing. Every we're missing a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> every every single um, mistakes you do, we're punished. In and back then, it was we 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 learned to respect our elder elderly people yeah. in that regard and. Um, I, I just grew up different in a way. I always dream about a better way of living life. Um, I've seen uh, the, the, the joy and happiness of living a really good traditional Tongan family. And I also seen the bad that um, some of the traditional way of disciplining has become. And I've always felt that there's got to be more. And I got to learn something more to it. So... When uh, I got the opportunity to serve a two-year missionary in okay. Canada. Okay. So prepping for that was really tough for me because I have to learn how to speak English. <laughs> and it it's was, not your first language. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. And then, and then I, I was hoping that I would stay locally so I don't have to learn a different language. But I have to like overcome a lot of my fears of talking to people, communicating. But what I found that communicating with people, I in turn learn more about something that improves me as a person Absolutely. oh yeah so when i went on my two-year missionary i learned the language i brought back a different way of disciplining different way of living the culture the right way yeah yeah uh, and then i've learned that there's more ways to discipline your kids or discipline a, a community than just like to stick to you know to the back you know, because that's how how how, that's how I, was it was back then. You know, <laughs> and um, there's there's more ways of communicating and negotiating if you're mad at your neighbors. Back then, back where I grew up, if you're mad at your neighbors, you sell it in in in, in the parking lot, <laughs> and then after that it's done, it's done. You guys are good, good. Let's go back to you know our normal life. And but I've learned that there's ways that you can communicate because that's one of the things that's missing. Yeah. It's the communication part of it. And it, it was huge for me. So I learned to speak. You would talk to people that have been here from Tonga for 40 years, and you can still see, hear. I still have an accent, but I've learned that I need to understand and communicate a lot better if I need to you know, learn um, the Western life, but also learn that to teach and to share it with my community. Because it's, it's, they can go hand in hand. What? Like, all right. So you, you came here to the United States. Yeah. So here, here's what I've noticed. I've noticed that a lot of times when foreigners come to the United States, because they don't have the advantage of like a safety blanket or something, they have to figure out how to make it work and how mm-hmm. to survive and how to, to, to find some momentum. Now, you, you own your own construction company. Right. Um, like, what, what was it like doing your journey to, to finally creating your own construction company? Because last, like last year, you had a really good year. Life really was good, really, yeah. really good. Life was good. Yes. For what I um, something that people should know about foreigners that are immigrating here. We 
I've told this told this story a, a multiple times. And um, back home, there's high tide and low tide. And when there is there's low tide, there's ponds of water sitting, you know, inside the reefs. And there's this little fish that swims in those ponds. And these little fish would believe that that is the whole wide world in that little <laughs> pond. Okay. Right. Now, <clears throat> when it's high tide, it opens their eyes. They're like, whoa, there's a lot more opportunities. There's a lot more stuff, you know. But, it, but they, they just believe when it's low tide that that is their whole, the biggest thing ever is that little pond. Immigrants that come here to the States, we bring that pond with us. So unless we change that mindset to think, oh, there's a lot more here, a lot more opportunities, a lot more ways to learn, a lot more ways to grow as a person, and a lot more success that we can accumulate if we just get away from that little pond and think about the future as like, all right, we're, we're in America. There's a lot more opportunities. The freedom that it gives us as well, too. But a lot of the times um, when I... This is just speaking for myself. Yeah. When I got here, I was just struggle. It was a great struggle because when I came here, I had the mindset of like, I'm in the bottom of the food chain now. <laughs> <laughs> because we, when we came in here and then you can ask any uh, immigrant and they probably have the same answer as I am. We believe that like whatever is left out in the opportunities, that's all we get. If that makes sense. So you get the leftovers. So we'll get left rather over. than being able to create and make your own. <laughs> yes. Okay. We get the leftovers. And like I said, I came in, I brought my pond with me, and I thought, this is my the leftover that I got, and this is what I what all I'm capable of doing. It took me a while until like I finally changed my mindset. I came here, I was working for uh family members. Okay. Unfortunately, I wasn't paid enough. But at the time that was my pond. <laughs> and, you know. Getting three hundred bucks a month to me that was like the biggest thing. I was, <laughs> I was learning. <laughs> I was, I was earning sixty bucks a week on my other job back home, you know, and it okay. was a tough work. Okay. And then come out here three hundred bucks a month. That was like my pond. It, it was huge, you know. I was walking around with like. Yeah. Head up behind me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And um, and and I remember I um, I remember I met somebody, and he asked me, "What are you making?" And I told him like hey, three hundred bucks a month. And he's like, he looks at me like, "Dude, <laughs> you can make way more than that." And I'm like, "Wait, what? what? Excuse me? <laughs> this is a month into like my first year, really?" And he's like, "Yeah, you can do this. You can do this." So I leveled up. I I realized that there's a lot more to that pond that I brought. Than I was thinking of, and it was like a matter of mindset. Just thinking that I'm worth more than three hundred bucks. I'm worth a thousand bucks. I'm worth, I'm worth two thousand bucks. You know, level up slowly to a point where I'm like, wow, this land is full of opportunities. Why am I selling for just that small pond? There's a vast ocean that I can fish from. Then just like focusing on that one pond. I think that was a lesson that I think. I want to share to a lot of kids that shows up here is that don't just settle for whatever you're given or the leftovers. There's more. And there's way you can achieve those if you just change the mindset, work hard for it, stay consistent. You can achieve it. Um, you ever read that book, The Richest Man? And, no, 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 no. The Millionaire Next Door? Yeah. That book was crazy. They went through and they documented all this wealthy people trying to figure out who's wealthy, what it's like, and all this stuff. And they found the, the, the strongest correlation of wealth among any immigrants that came to the United States. It was the Irish. Wow. Why? The Irish were not liked. The Irish were punished and intentionally put down. But because they went through that adversity and they struggled, they actually ended up having to figure out how to build a business, <laughs> create a business, to sell a thing, to do a thing. Wow. And they are, they had actually had the highest concentration of wealth in the United States. And you would have thought, you would have thought that it was the people that were sitting here with the opportunities that would have grabbed that. Yeah. And you know, it's crazy. Like, as you think about it, like a lot of folks here in the United States actually are employees of companies. Right. And you made a transition to actually owning the company. 
Mm-hmm. Like what, what caused you to say, wait a minute, why I'm going to take and own this thing. Why, why, why not? Like why, <laughs> why not? There's a, a story that I always, not a story, but basically a concept of like the pizza. Eh? If there's a pizza here, yeah, brought up because of my personality, I'll wait for everybody to take their piece before I take my piece. <laughs> you know, and I remember somebody mentioned it to me. It's like, when are you gonna be able to fight for your piece? Or if you want to take two, yeah. And I remember I was doing construction or working up north, and I've seen the money back and forth transition. You know, yeah. And like I get the the, the lower end of that piece of that pizza every single job we do, and I'm like thinking. When am I going to fight to get me that chunk of pizza that he's fighting for? So that's when I started doing, you know, figuring out. And that's the, the, the concept of it. It's like a lot of times people think they're like, oh, I have to have a certain skills. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. I'm the less, the least person that when it comes to like hard labor work. I hated hard labor work. <laughs> I was forced to do it, but I did not like it at all. But once I figure out that, like, if I'm going to be able to fight for that second piece of the pizza, I have to put in more work than I normally am. Because what you put in is what you get back. So after I did my job in the, end the, in the evenings, I went up, knocked doors. I was talking to people. I'm like, hey, I'm just in the area. I live just across the street. I do cement work. If you need uh, any project in the future in the summer, let me know. I, I'm, and, and then I give them my phone number. At the time, I didn't know that you can pass around a business card. <laughs> <laughs> okay. gotcha. So I was just knocking, knocking, knocking. And then um, at first, I didn't get any uh, concrete work, but I got um, yard work, like cleaning up, raking leaves. And I was like, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it for like 200 bucks a day. So after I work on my job on the weekends, Saturdays, I'm like hauling all my tools in my wife's um, Toyota Corolla (laughs) (laughs) sitting on the middle of that little car. But I didn't care. I just wanted to go there, clean it, put it on the tarps. And I remember the first time somebody handed me 200 bucks for my own effort of doing my own business. Yeah. It's a different feeling. It It changed my mind in a lot of ways. I remember when he handed me the, the 200 bucks, it was only like four hours of work, yeah. um, cleaning out, raking leaves, trimming out the trees, putting it in, a, in their trash bin. He paid me, and I walked home, and I looked at it, and I'm like, wow, I did that. I I actually did that. It just fired me to go out more and knock more doors. <laughs> <laughs> so I did it. I went out on the weekends, knocked doors, and it was just like job after job. And then finally, as I was working, um, doing working for a different company doing concrete eventually yeah. people are like oh yeah i got a little four by four that needs to be poor cement yeah so that was my first one you took the four, a little oh yeah a little, little job, little job. Took it. i took it and then after i finished it looked at it and i'm like i did that you know i did that and like to see the smile on people's face i'm like yeah i'm doing something good here. i'm good i'm getting somewhere little by little and then next thing you know i'm doing like four five yards and then now i'm doing 30 you know, 40 yards if they're, you know, people wanted. And by looking back, that was like the beginning of it. It was just, that. and I, I felt like it was, I, I had my challenges, you know. Oh, yeah. And I'm never, people never be happy. And sometimes one thing that I've learned about myself is that if I don't, I don't if I don't think about that pond, I would <laughs> eventually get my way back into that pond, if that makes sense. I will get into a point where I'm like running great, getting more successful, getting jobs, meeting new people, creating more relationship. But that, that pond keeps sneaking up on me. But if I'm not conscious about that in my head, I'll always refer back to that little little fish in that pond. I think a lot of people make that mistake because yeah. you have to make the mindset. Like my guess is who do you hang around with when you think about it? Because you're, you're starting to hang around with people that are more successful. And my guess is it's starting to change your vibration. It's making you say, wait a minute. Life could be better. I could do this. You saw money changing hands. You're like, what do we make? I want some of that. <laughs> yeah. I want two pieces of pizza here. <laughs> yeah. And before long, you're like, you're vibrating at a new level, right? Mm-hmm. It's crazy. I tell people proximity is power. 
you get in proximity to somebody that's got a, the ability to influence and change your life. Like the number one secret I tell people, you want to, you want to change your life, get close to somebody that's already done it. And they will right. drop gold nuggets on you left and right. And next thing your mind will start shifting and changing. But it's crazy, bro. We we do. We get we get stuck in our past. Like, what did my dad do? How did my dad treat me? How did my like, bro, like what if they did a bad job? Like, why would I want to <laughs> dig up that bone? Yeah. You know what I mean? And and I, I love the fact that like hearing your story, I love the fact that you're like, like, this is where I came from, but this does not mean this is where I have to stay. Like, I don't have to choose that life. Yeah. I could choose a better life. I mean, that's cool. Yeah, people get scared of knocking doors, dude. <laughs> so for a guy that was kind of shy, oh, right, it was a learning curve. Me and myself, and I, I can go knock doors any day now. It's because like it's just it's one thing like you know social media. You can post on social media, or you go on Google and you get jobs like that. But there's nothing more fulfilling than actually knock on somebody's door and actually having a quality conversation. You know, and I'm not the best at it. I'm, I'm not, you know, there's more people more qualified than me, <laughs> but just because of my personality and, and it's just, I've, I really love learning from people like you, you know, I walk yeah. in here, I want to know who you are and, you know, what you do and what have you done. And, and then to me, I see that as a, uh, that, you, that just becomes my story. You know, I met Mike and I can tell everybody, you know, and then like I come home or I talk to somebody and they brought up some something about uh, a certain sport or situation I'm like i met a, a lady that i knock on their door and she talked about this you know and nothing is more important to me than create that quality relationship in a way and i feel like it's missing um we're living in a world where i can just text you tell you this and this and this but there's lack of uh, the, those quality times of having one-on-one -on -one conversation and to me like when i'm feeling like down I'll go knock doors, you know, even if it's business, but I just, sometimes people just want to talk and they'll like, they'll talk my ear off. <laughs> you know, That's and, the truth. and I love to listen, you know, and, and when I'm listening, I'm like, there's something about listening to people. Like you can take a hint of what kind of person they are, if they're telling you a story or something. Isn't that crazy? You pick up on the pattern. Yeah. Just hear them out. You're like, I know where you're at in life. Yes. I yes. hear the words. They say the word, I can't. I'm like, oh, you, well, you, got, you got all kinds of limitations. You just told me that you, you create barriers. For you, and that probably prohibits a lot of your success. It does. It does. And I think um, I heard this earlier this morning on uh, one of the podcasts. We all have intuition. And they did a case study of like men and women's intuition. They come out like just balanced, normal, and the same. The only difference is... Women act on their intuition, so that's why they're smarter. Than us. <laughs> we just want the fast way of doing things, so we just like skip that or you know avoid it. So I'm like trying to key into like that, you know, my feelings, what I think um, when I talk to people, you know, what they make me feel, you know, what I can contribute to any conversation. So I feel like it's 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 a good. I think it, it fuels me in a way, if that makes sense. There, like one of the things you just said right there, because I've knocked my fair share of doors and talked to a fair share of people, and, and I noticed that there's a couple things I noticed. People buy from friends, mm -hmm. and one of the quickest ways to become friends is that the fact that you were willing to listen to them. And I've, I've had people that were just like straight up, I'm not interested in this thing. But then they start talking to me, then they end up liking like me, it. and then they're like, you know what? <laughs> Why don't you come over and talk to me and show me this thing? And then I show it to them. And they're like, I didn't know that. I didn't realize all that value was there. Like, I didn't realize that. And then they're like, yeah, I would like that thing. Mm -hmm. But it only came about because of what you said, which is like, dude, I swear it's one of the secrets to the rags of riches is figuring out how to listen to people, hear what, like, people want to be heard. Yeah. And you give, you give them a chance and all of a sudden they're like, I like you. Why don't mm -hmm. we do business? <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's uh the book of like um how to win friends and influence people talk yeah. about that when i'm speaking to somebody i want to hear them more there's a lot of time we talk about ourselves a lot more to people you know i did this i do that but if you take the chance to listen to people you'll find there's golden nuggets in that conversation itself you just basically make them feel that they're more important you know than who you are 
Yeah, because I can go with a flag around. Oh yeah, you know I'm a. I'm running a business, you know, I make this certain amount of money. But if you listen to people, they'll walk away feeling, man, I just made a friend, you know, yeah. in that conversation. And that's what I want in every conversation that I do. I want somebody to walk away and I'm like, I like that guy. He's a good guy, you know. You did a, you made a shift in your life because you, you said there was a time when you used to play rugby. And I've seen oh. your pictures and I've watched <laughs> you do it. You were like, you were rough, bro. <laughs> You were rough. You didn't yeah. like talking to him. You'd probably take him out in the parking lot rather than talk. <laughs> and now you've done a 180 where oh. you like you became like I would say soft, but you you became willing to talk and communicate instead of try to be aggressive and go like settle this thing. <laughs> but it sounds like it, it, on that journey you started actually making real friends. Yeah. So I I, I share this story not to be able to. I think like when I was raised, we were raised a lot different. Um, like, you know, I talked about it. Tough love, you know. I've never seen my mom and dad show expression of love. They'll say I love you, but no kisses, no hugs, no nothing, you know. Okay. And um, I grew up just thinking that like, like we have two emotions that people don't know about. In our, our community, and I could be wrong, there's sad and there's happy. There's no in between stress, <laughs> depressed. <laughs> You know, anxiety. There's no in between. We don't know any in between. And then that's what I'm trying to teach young youth nowadays in my community. It's like, look, there is in between. We're just not taught that. We are either sad or angry or we're like the opposite. Just happy, cheerful, you know, and all that. Growing up, when I'm mad at somebody, we go either the other way or the other way. If that makes sense. Like I would yeah. go there. I'm like, all right, let's settle this in the front yard. Let's do it. <laughs> Once we get at it, you know, bled, bleed, and, you know, beaten up. We're like, are you good? Right, I'm good. All right, I'm going right. to go home. <laughs> <laughs> rugby, history of rugby is a very rough sport. Every single time, you know, when you're tired playing the game, somebody, you know, hits you in the wrong way or does something that doesn't key into it, there's always a fight breakup. And when I grew up, there was a huge riot between my high school and a different high school constant constant where they it's just like something normal you do after school and people don't know you know people don't know it and i'm sharing this because like i look back i'm like we so were after school they would intentionally go pick fights oh yeah you? oh yeah like intentionally daily well, oh definitely there would be kids hanging out in town town just looking for trouble you know in a daily way and if there is a, a huge rugby game we're all there hoping somebody starts it <laughs> <We can answer. laughs> you know or, you know, when even when I played a sport, something hit, somebody hit me right, I'm hitting back. Because yeah. I cannot, you know, the yeah. alpha mentality, I would not show <laughs> weakness to that guy. You know, if he punched me in the face, I'm punching back. Even though he'll beat me up, but I will show him. I'll stand my ground. That was like our, you know. And even when then riots uh, broke up, if you're running, oh, we'll come home and beat you up. We'll have to stand there and fight back, you know, growing up. And it was just... I thought it was normal. I thought that's how we live life. Yeah. You know, growing up, it was just rough. And my first few job here, I had to like control myself. I snapped a little bit. Somebody <laughs> broken a few noses. But then like looking back, I'm like, my wife's like, you know, this is America. This is not Tonga. People call to the cops. <laughs> when you do that, <laughs> people, you know, press charges. So I have to learn to, you know, control myself a lot better. Yeah. Um, and I remember I talked to my dad right before he died and I was just we were just you know talking like reminiscing on the past and he mentioned something that has been sticking with me for a really long time and um, I asked him like what is the definition of a real man a tough tough man and because me I looked at him as like a really tough guy never shows any emotion he works I never see him like or never hear him say tight I'm tired no, he just work, work, work. That's all he does. And I remember he says, a tough guy controls his heart or his emotion. Dude, there's value in that. It's been, it's been with me ever since. Every time my, my anger spikes or my emotion spikes, any kind of emotion, anxiety, he, the, his voice always sings to me, a tough man handles his emotions. So I always like, all right, what am I feeling right now? What can I do to change? Where can I go to avoid this? So it has been like living with, me. and then coming here, I married a, my wife is Canadian. So she, okay. she grew up in the Western society of things, disciplining kids, 
I came from a different way of disciplining kids <laughs> and a way <laughs> of like did. living. I remember the first time like we started showing emotion. It was just weird to me, you know. But I have to learn it because that's in in my head. In in order for me to survive and to to you know live here, I have to control those emotions. I have to basically learn a new identity in order for me to grow. I've talked to counseling, talked to like therapists, you know, <laughs> so they can figure out what's going on. And a lot of the things that I react on comes from the past. Things that I've done in the past that like, if I get angry, I have a response there. It's yep. like automatic. Yep. So I have to like rewrite a lot of things that has happened in the past so that I can be able to just be a normal person. <laughs> There's truth to that. <clears throat> That, yeah. I mean, you already described mindset. Like, you, if I pull back what you already said, you said you had to play a game of mindset. Like, am I worth 300 bucks? Like, mm -hmm. I'm worth way more than 300 bucks. Why, like, why am I going to play that game? But that, that was like, people get stuck in the past, and they don't realize, like, I, it's like a, it's like a record. When a record gets played, it's got these grooves, right? Right. And people keep sliding back into those grooves, but they don't realize that there was a traumatic experience in their past that smacked that thing and caused it to cause that behavior to to, to appear. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you you were, became conscious of it said, "Look, that that was stupid. Let me let me do something different. Yeah. New, new choice. I play this game all the time. It's <laughs> like working, not working. New choice. Is it not working? Like yeah. I don't want to pick fights anymore. Okay, so it's not working. All right. So what is working? These are working. Well, what's my new choice? That's you right. play that game." And I could see it, and I'll bet that that's, that's got to be the shift that you experienced that's caused your income to shift significantly. Your relationships to significant. Like, one question I've got for you. So if your parents never showed affection, so what do you do now with your wife in front of your kids? Do you, do you carry your dad's same, same method forward, or do you allow your kids to see some affection now? I, I allow my kids to see affection. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be the first to admit. And I, there is some... Uh, benefits to it yeah. for me you know because i've never seen it i watch it on movies right. that's pretty much all that i have seen is you know the affection part of it it's on movies in my community it was just tough love they know they love each other we know we they know you know but it's just it's something about showing it it's healthy especially for kids and that's why i feel like beneficial is that my kid sees that i'm showing affection to their mother and they know one day they'll find a man that shows affection, you know, because <laughs> like it took me a lot of learning. And what I'm doing right now is breaking that chain in that regard, um, you know, in that sense, so that when my uh, future generation grows up, they will see a different way of, you know, showing love. It's not just like, you know, I love you and then, you know, go back to it. It's, you show it. You genuinely show it to them that you love them because it's, it's a healthy uh, concept if them. Like, my kids see it, and they're like, yeah, I'll find a man kind of like my dad, you know? Right. <laughs> that would show me love, you know, instead of man that just doesn't, you know? Just quiet and just never said it to in front of people, you know? It affects kids, I know. It does. It does. My, my wife, I think her dad's told her like three times in her entire life that she can remember that he loves her. Yeah. And so if he sends her a card, and if he put that word in it, she has the card. She won't throw it away. She's like, you don't ever say it. Like, how am I supposed to know? I don't know. But like, but breaking that chain of the past. Yeah. Like that, that's a big deal. You have to, you have to change, break that chain. One of the things that, you know, I, I think it's appropriate to have. Our men discipline our kids and in the midst of disciplining them, they would say, I'm doing this because I love you. That's the <laughs> only time that I affiliate I love you is when I am punished or disciplined. <laughs> so you can see I had to work extra hard to know that there is a healthier way of saying I love you. Yeah, because you know? it didn't feel like love. Did it, it didn't feel like it. Dude, I'm like, I'm it. out here crying. Bro, like, <laughs> less love for me, man. You keep that love. <laughs> so, there, there, you know, breaking the chain is what I'm after. I'm trying to teach a way, a different way of raising kids, parenting, Showing love and affection. Because if in my, with my experience with my culture, if we're not taught that knowledge, we'll just continue to live in that pond. Yep. We're still going to be staying in that mindset. Unless somebody says something that it's, you know, acknowledged. And you know what's funny? Recently, I've been speaking out about it. You know, either in my social media 
or even when I'm sitting down with friends. And guess what? Everybody's like, I understand what you're saying. I know. I agree. Yeah. And I'm like, why doesn't everybody, anybody say it or acknowledge it or express it? And I'm sure they probably express it in the right way. But I've learned in my experience, there's a healthier way of teaching those kinds of principles, if, especially if it's a culture that has been years and years of being instilled on the community. There's a healthier and a better way. We can't just walk out there, whip around the whip, and this is how you should do this. And this, yeah. <laughs> this, and I think boundaries is a key thing that you know I've seen that have have helped me. I set boundaries with everybody, and not necessary boundaries where I'm like forcing them. I'm just saying like, look, when you do certain things, this is what I think. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not trying to change them. They understand now that like whatever they're doing, this is what affects me in a way. Is I do it with my friends, my family members, you know, even my own family. I um, they appreciate that. Oh, at they least do. they know where you're coming from. Yeah. And um, a lot of times we, we kind of fake a lot of things or BS a lot of things to make it look good. I just tell them straight up, this is what's going on and this is what I feel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, 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 you know, they get either take it the wrong way, or the good way or the, the wrong way. It doesn't matter, but at least they know where I stand. And I think that's yeah. one of the things I'm trying to help a future generation in the Polynesian community. It's, There's value in that. Yeah. Because there, I went to a training once with uh, one of my friends. He's got a company that's about a, he's running about $100 million a year. And he's like, you know what? He goes, one of the things is getting in your guys' way. He goes, you guys sugarcoat way too much crap. Like, nobody understands where you're coming from, what you're doing. Yeah. Like, I don't understand it. And so he had to, he had this play as this game. He says, okay, what we're going to do in this, in this instance is, I want you to go up and meet somebody, and you got you got three answers. You can say, so the, the context is, is um, your mom needs to go to the hospital, and you have to find somebody to take her because you, because you can or something. You have to go up to him and say, I trust you that you will take her there. I'm not sure, or I don't trust you. And he says, begin. So everybody went around and do it, and, <laughs> and we were playing this game, right? Yeah. And then he got, got done at the, at the end of the game, and he goes, all right. He goes, how many people said that I trust you? And, and people would raise their hand. And how many said they didn't? And how many of you guys, he's trying to look at, see what kind of how we, how, we, how we play it out. He goes, how many of you guys said I'm not sure? A lot of hands went up. He goes, you guys are a bunch of sugar coders. Like, ain't nobody understanding you. That's your nice way of saying, I don't trust you. Wow. But he's like, you're a pussy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God, I got to level up. Yeah. But the fact that people understand where you're coming from, like yeah. it's difficult because like I don't know like what are you gonna do with oh, I'm not sure that, I mean you're really saying no but you're you're just not acknowledging like maybe maybe like I don't know and they approach you a lot different yeah than what I've seen as part of you um, getting out of that pond because if you sugarcoat it a lot you you're still in with that pond with that person yeah but if you are looking into a wider brighter more opportunities can't sugarcoat it and I'm not perfect at it. But I do have uh, people that I'm I, that holds me accountable. If that makes sense. Yeah, no sugar. No, no sugar going <laughs> Yeah, and even if I'm starting to ravel out, and they'll tell me like, "Yeah, you're just BSing it. Come on, man. Come on, come on." <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's one of the things that has helped me is that I have people that I hold accountable to. And this, you know, the Russian. You've learned about the Russians. They're very straightforward with it. They'll tell yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> to make you shiver you know because of the truth you know but i think that's one of the things that i've noticed as well too and i'm not saying that I, we should always be perfect about it but there's certain times where like i draw the line especially with um, family members and stuff like that one of the things that people do that always um gets me and i'm trying to work out on is that i've had a past i've made a lot of mistakes yep I probably owed some people some money from bailing me out from about a couple of jails. <laughs> and what they do is they, in the past, they would use my past, make me feel guilty so I can help them or send oh, money to them. Okay. Trying to control your future yes. based on your past. Yeah. And that's why I have to like level up on like understanding my emotions or what I'm feeling and what I can do about it and why I'm going to do it about it. Because I was just tired of it. I get broke just because like I'm just... I post a lot of things on social media that I feel like, you know, I've done something good. I, even if it's concrete, family life, I post about some trips and stuff. To people, they to a lot of uh, family members and a lot of my community think that I'm, I got 
this million dollar in my pocket. So I be- just become a target of like, hey, man, uh, you remember me. I was with you in high school. Remember that? Remember the old days? Remember the good times, man? Like, or somebody was like, hey, remember, I, you owe me something, you know? Yeah. Like, but like, I have to ask myself, since when did us helping somebody become them owing us, you know, that? Especially parents, and I hear a lot of parents that are like, I raise you, so now you owe me. And this is just happening in our community. So I'm trying to like help them, like, look, you raise a kid, that's your responsibility. But that doesn't say it means that like you owe them that, you know, that like they'll go and get married, have kids of their own, and you're still going to hold that them guilty that because you raise them, they owe you something. So if my kids get older and have their own family, I would be proud. I'll support them. If anything, I'll be the one spoiling them until I die. But that's just me. Like not that. spoil them, but help them. You know? Oh, yeah. But I'm not going to go there. I'm like, look, I raised you. I fed you. You owe me this. <laughs> 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 and that was one of the, the traps of that little pond has followed me. And I and I struggle with it today, too. And I have to, like, always be mindful. You mentioned yeah. another trap that you ran into. You mentioned that when you were down in Tonga. You said that any time you start obtaining success or somebody starts getting momentum in Tonga, somebody's like, no. no. They come smack that nail, knock it down. They don't want you to, they don't want, it's like it's like the crabs in the bucket, right? When yeah. crabs start to move, like, no, 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 no. We're going to grab you and we're going to pull you back down. Yes. Like, I mean, as you're trying to, as you were, I mean, you obviously broke free because you came here and you started making some changes. Yeah. Like, I don't know, what, just kind of curious how that, you had to make an identity shift in my mind to be able to to not be in that bucket and yeah. be okay being successful. Yeah. That's a, a huge mindset as well. I was in that trap. I would become such good thing on doing so good, getting some kind of a success in our own ways. And then like my friends like, yeah, no, that doesn't work, man. You're just wasting your time. The crap effect happens yeah. a lot. Even if anybody uh, raise this awareness of like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm dreaming of building a huge business, um, even if it's selling goods, selling products, or providing a better service. It's like the family just attacks, you know? Either they um, straight away just attacks him, or they like make smart co- uh, comments about what he's trying to do and trying to achieve. And people don't know this, but it eats on a lot of people's mind if, oh, yeah. if they let it. So that mindset with me was one of the things that I have to shift. Coming out here, I realized, and I still have it, when on the beginning, people would say, like, you can't make it. None of us Tongans would be able to do it. But I'm looking around, like, I hang out with a bunch of Tongans that does make it. They're making a lot, a lot of money of doing it, you know? <laughs> now, what are you guys talking about? But I think it's just that mindset that they bring, that pawn. They're trying to... They feel like they, they're not part of it or they, they feel like you're doing better than them Then they want to pull you down so you guys can sit on the same pond again. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. The mindset shift for me was, there was a quote by Les Brown that says, um, do not let other people's judgment or whatever they say becomes your reality. So I, I often think of myself like, is, is what they're saying is my reality or I have a different reality ahead of me? So I always constantly think about that. And um, a lot of the time, it's just when they say things like that, it's just they feel like they can't level up to your level. But that doesn't mean that you have to, like, drop down to their level. It's just right. appreciate it. Move right. on. You know, I post a lot of content on, on TikTok. A lot of people say, you post too much content. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. I just throw it in there, you know. Because if they're not, you know, but the thing is, they'll say that, but they'll keep all, those are the people that watch, you know, my content. And to me, it's just a, it's just a confirmation that you can be a creator of your life or you let the society dictate what you become. Which is leftovers. Oh, yeah, leftovers. <laughs> I, I want to be the guy fighting for that piece of pizza every day. I've learned recently that there's a, a point in my life where I get that mindset, I'm confident, Nothing negative is going to, and then, like, I fall back. And I realize the reason why is, like, um, I have to constantly feed my mind with positive things. I read books. I listen to podcasts. I listen to audiobooks. I hang out with friends that are very successful, more successful than I am. But 
I do learn a big nuggets from it, and it keeps me grounded. Um, a lot of, you know, the phrases like you're the average of your five best friends that you hang out with, right? Um, a lot of times, my friends, if I feel like my friends are putting me down, I read books. I'd rather listen to, you know, a very <laughs> successful guy. They're my friends, you know. They would, you know, give, feed my mind with positive so I can stay grounded and Boy. focus on what I need to do to be successful. It's kind of crazy you're saying that because you obviously know who Tony, or Tony Robbins is, right? Yeah. He, he was nicknamed in high school the Wonder Boy because he could do some crazy crap and he could make some crazy right. money. The guy was very, very talented. Wow. What he described is, is he started moving up. Life started getting better. But his friends would became uncomfortable being around him because they, didn't, they chose not to level up. And because of that, they kept trying to pull him down. And in the end, he actually had to just... He had to do a reboot and, and put different people in his lives. It's like, I can't, I can't be at that level. Yeah. But, and he, what, what actually ended up happening to him is he actually ended up losing it all. Oh, Tony right. Robbins ended up losing it all. He got down to, I think he had a buck something in his, like five bucks in his pocket. He was at an, uh, he was at a restaurant where he figured he could eat all he could eat and get all his food done in one day because he mm-hmm. couldn't afford to go back. It was an all you can eat. He saw some lady come in with her kid and sat down at the table and he was like, and the kid was like a gentleman and he was like, wow, he was just so impressed that he went over and he like, he's like something like, you're taking your mom out on a date. He's like, that's just so cool. He's like, let, I'm going to let you pay. And he took all the money he had in the whole world. It's like $5 and 47 cents or something and gave it to gave the it kid. To wow. And he said that he ran out of there and he left and he said he ran and ran and ran. All the way home, he says his lungs were about ready to burst. He was about to throw up. And he's like, he got out of shape because he, he thought people thought that he didn't deserve it. So he, he started believing it. So he allowed his body to get out of shape. He went broke. He lived in a place where it was so small that he washed his dishes in his bathtub. And in one year from that moment, he changed his mind. He, was, uh, he had made a million dollars and he had a mansion on the beach. He went from there to there. And I literally just had to say enough's enough. Like, like yeah. people will tear you down because they are uncomfortable with your success. It's a success. And you yeah. describe that little pond, man. Oh, yeah. don't, you, don't you dare get out of that <laughs> pond. If you don't get out of that pond, you're like, I'm getting out. Yeah. I will get out. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. If, if you can't, if you, like, that's one of the things that I feel like it's happening. You know, every day I hear it from a lot of successful people talking about like people are trying to constantly pull them down. And if they do, it means you're doing something good in right? life. <laughs> you're going places. <laughs> you didn't make a dent. Yeah. Nobody would care. Yeah. But you, you know? keep the care because you made a, di- a, a dent. A dent. Yes. Yes. And what, I, what I've, I've noticed as well, too, is that when you create a different identity, and usually when you have a mindset shift, it usually comes with a different identity of who you are as a person and your priorities are different as well too even me in the past i prioritized like partying hanging out with friends you know just wasting a lot of time and doing things but recently after a good quality portion of my years trying to figure out this mindset shift you know (laughs) i become a different you know person you know and um i remember one of a a friend of mine he's a good mentor i tell him like i'm gonna make a million dollar and he looks at me like that bs yeah, I'm serious. I'm going to make a million dollars. I'm going to be the first time to be a millionaire. And he says, you're not going to make it. He was like, and I said, why? Why don't you believe me? And he says, because in order for you to be a millionaire, you have to act. You have to become a millionaire. Right there and then changed my mindset. It was like in beginning, my, it was the end of uh, 2019, going into 2020. I started January just like, just furious because i have to become i was just like if that person makes certain amount like i have to be you know i have to level up and become somebody else become the millionaire then in my head that's what i'm saying and i write it down I write it down i put it in my one of my drawers in my office i pull it up i'm like yep first time i'm going to be a millionaire pull it back i'm like all right let's go let's Look roll at it. i looked at Daily. it yes because you, you know we learned that you have to visualize your future and you constantly remind yourself I sometimes have an alarm about who, what kind of person that I have. I do three alarms during the day. Okay. And all it says is confidence and relentless. Dude, those are the two secret ingredients, yeah. bro. And 
it just rings and I pull it up, it's the random alarm, but I name it that. Because when I see it, all right, refocus. That's who I'm going to become today. Because that's a way of you creating your life, not just letting the world dictate what kind of life you become. You know, Because if you let it, they're going to eat your life. You just have to be not better, but it's a different vibration. So that's what I do. And that alarm has served me. You know, for months and months, because I'm constantly walking into appointment with that two things in head. You know, I go into estimates. I talk to people. If I'm hiring somebody, I have to live up to that person. That millionaire attitude, the millionaire person reminds me in my alarm, and I'm ready to sit. I'm ready to go, and it just gives me a more humbly experience with other people. I do also have to remind myself not to be over cocky or let my ego over me. Because I sometimes do that a lot, and we do that a lot of the time. But now I'm more interested in people. I want to hear people's story, how they become successful. And it, success to me is basically somebody working towards a goal every day. It's not like how much money, what kind of car. You know, you've seen my truck. You know, I get it, big, it's it. <laughs> yeah, but like that, that, that truck <laughs> is like it's it's an old truck, and I drive it around. I've seen guys driving out in way newer model than I do but it really doesn't matter to me what kind of vehicle what house you have but if you're constantly working towards like a very successful goal to me that's success I love that vibration I'll sit there and listen to people talk about their you know their story all day long so yeah I find a lot of nuggets in that I uh it's funny you talk about that I do that every day I take and there was like one of the stories that I really liked, there was a, when, when Disneyland got built, right? Mm -hmm. This reporter came up to Walt Disney's brother and he's like, he said, man, too bad Walt's not here to see uh, to see Disneyland. And he goes, he goes, he looks at the guy, he's like, excuse me? <laughs> he goes, Walt saw this before it existed. It's just you that are now seeing it. Wow. He's like, he already created it in his mind. He's like, it was created twice. You just saw the second creation. <laughs> and I look at it and like I take and I do the same thing every day. I'm like, all right, like we're, we're going to kill this. What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. And I sit down and I, I figure it out. I'm like, all right, so here's my goal. And uh, like, this is the goal. This is what I'm going to achieve. And then I take time in the morning. I visualize it. Like, I'd like to say that I came up with that on my own. But I watched Tony Robbins, yeah. one of the guys that I like. And dude is packed full of rituals. He's got habits of success that create success. Mm -hmm. And you just said it. Okay, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to visualize it. You add these elements in your day where you're like, dude, this is how I'm going to think. This yeah. is how I'm going to behave. Like I joke around like, you see these kids running around with their tongue hanging out, jumping like Michael Jordan. I'm like, you know why? Because he's acting like Michael Jordan. He yeah. might actually be it <laughs> yeah. someday. And he and you're modeling success. That's what that's what he did. I'm like, and, and near as I could tell, I, I mean, you've read that book, Think and Grow Rich, right? Yeah. Boy, those guys visualize it. They write it out. They run it out. I take and I put these guys up on the wall. I love that. In fact, I put those things on the wall because when guys end up coming and working for me, I'm like, bro, here's the trophy, man. Like, you go hit this, you get that. Mm -hmm. I want them to be able to see it so that break free from that 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 broke mindset. Like, you don't need to be broke. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a choice. It's not required. That's, that's It's true. a choice. Like, is that what you want? <laughs> like, just, just decide. Like, I don't want to be broke. Okay, then what do you want to do? Okay, then let's talk about that. Now let's get a roadmap, A to B. How are you going to get there? Oh, you need a plan. All right, let's get a plan. The thing that I like that you described, because if your plan, if your plan would have been continuing to work for $300 a month, actually, like, I'm, as I think about it, I don't know how many people can become millionaires that actually don't own a business. You know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about? And I'm like... I, I worked at a defense contractor that had the good life. It, dude, I got stuck in a vacuum. It was easy. Like, this recession came, didn't even notice it. Like, wow. every, everywhere else was struggling. Recession, I didn't notice it. Life was good, good, and I kept going. But because I got complacent and I got trapped in okay, I, like, I got stuck there. And I, it, was, it was, dude, it was like a, I was like a plunger, man. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> trying to come back out. Wow. I'm like, whoa. But but then finally you, you break free, and it's crazy because your break free came 
Actually, you know what's you know what's cool about your story when you were talking about that? What? Your ability to break free actually came the allocation of your free time that created your opportunity mm-hmm. to start your business. But had you had had you had had the mindset that I'm going to go work and then I'm going to come home and just play, go dink around and and, and not use any of my free time to start creating a better life, you probably would have got stuck. Mm-hmm. It goes back to that ritual that you talk about. Every successful person that I've, you know, learned and read their books, they have some kind of ritual that they constantly reshape themselves in a position to be successful. And I have to like think about like, okay, what kind of habits that I'm doing right now that is not benefiting me to be <laughs> to reach my goal? Not working. Yes, you know. Yeah. And I, and I make a list of like priorities or right, a family, God, this and this, work and this. And if like my my action priorities is just on the bottom, so I had to rethink. And you have to like schedule it in. I suck at re- scheduling anything, <laughs> you know. But recently I'm trying, you know. I schedule, okay, here's prayers, scripture reading, time to be able to do this, time to do this and this and this. Oh, goes through my priorities. So when at the end of the day, I feel like, oh, yeah, I've done. You yeah, actually that's awesome. Action. And I also have to learn that there's some actions that are basically a waste of time. If, in my head, I'm like, I'm busy. Try it. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know? And those are the the, the, the things that are like the worst. The trap. The is, trap. The yeah. trap believing you're productive because you're busy. Busy. There ain't nothing getting done. Nothing. Yeah. No big levers. No rocks moving up hills. Nothing. Yeah. But you're busy. But I'm busy. I'm busy. You know, it goes back to that uh, 2080 rule. You know? What are the 20% work that you're doing so you can be profit? Do that more. Cause, but I find myself struggle, you know, hanging out with the eighty eighty percent work, you know, and then tell myself I'm busy. But I actually, you know, I was talking to a friend and he completely changed my mindset. Yeah, we have a lot of talents in our community as far as construction. We're a strong man. Yeah, you, you know. Are. <laughs> yeah, but no brains. <laughs> and what I mean is like nobody can. I didn't. I'm not saying brains are like you know. Nobody's smart, but I'm saying like there has to be somebody that connects everybody so that people can profit for everybody can profit better. Yeah. We're all out here. We grew up together, family, friends, but we're individually doing our own thing. What I'm trying to do is like, okay, you're good at this. If anything I run into, like I need it, I'm not going to do it myself. I'm going to call you. I'm like, hey, come help me with this, doing this. I know you do a better job in doing it. I know I can do it. But I know you can do it. So I'm collecting our community together so we can process. They make money. I make money. And we walk away with a really good quality work. That's what we're doing right now is doing that. Oh, somebody needs work and help here. All right. Who's good at it? Who's good at that? And so what I'm trying to do is sort out, all right, who's good at this? Who's good at framing? Who's good at pouring? Who's good at finishing? So we kind of work together instead of like one person like, I can do it all. And that's... What I'm trying to do is like, yeah, we can all do it. We have the talents to figure it out and do it ourselves. But what if we can work together to individually benefit each other? So it's the talent that I want to like figure out to capture that amongst our people. Why go on our own and try to figure out things where we can work as a collective people to prosper? You know, prosper. We make that mistake a lot here in Utah. Yeah. Everybody loves to do their own thing and be the DIY guy. Yeah. I'm like, you sure you wouldn't make more money if you actually allowed talented people to do that thing instead of trying to do everything? Everything you own. Like, why don't you just do the one good thing you're good at? Yeah. Like, get that right. Yeah. Because we, I think we get stuck yeah. being okay with average instead of being excellent. Mm. Like, I'm, I'm average at everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a regular average at everything. But, I, but, I, but I'm awesome at nothing. I even suck at some things, but I'm not <laughs> awesome at it, right? Yes. Like, dude, like, that's one of the things that I've worked on with my business. Like, I used to kind of work on editing my own videos. I'm, in the end, I was like, screw this, bro. You can hire you somebody. You can get, like, your stuff is so much better. Like, I'm done. I can't I can't get there from A to B. I got, yeah. There's too many, there's too actually, part of it is, is when I look at it too, not every job has the same value. I made this mistake. This is the mistake I made when I was younger. When I was younger, I went and got a job. My dad's like, hey, you know, if you go down to Albertsons and you keep talking to them, eventually the guy's going to hire you, right? So eventually they did. And I, I was okay. down there and I was bagging groceries. I was a great grocery bagger. I was awesome, man. 
People love me. <laughs> Bro, like, there ain't no way on this God's green earth you're going to get paid a lot for bagging somebody's groceries. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not, it's it's just not in the cards. But if somebody would have said to me, Mike, look, here, let me tell you the secret to life. And they would have said, here, here's the deal. Go find yourself an influencer. Go find yourself somebody that knows how to make some stuff happen. Mm-hmm. Go hang out with them. Go, like, I don't care what it takes. Go do something with them. Help them. And, and if you put yourself in proximity to that, you will discover your life's going to change. And wow. I, I wasted way too many years. I, like, I've got a friend, okay? He, he went on his mission. Went on his mission, came back. He was doing sales of this company. Well, he's making, I don't know, he's probably making okay money. But his big, his big goal was, I want to figure out how to make a million bucks. I want to be, I want to be a millionaire. Mm-hmm. So he quit that job, and he went and worked for a guy who was in the real estate space that was an influencer. When he got in proximity to him, he learned marketing. He learned how to create sales funnels. He figured out how to create products. He oh, figured wow. out how to create video, how to create content, how to run events from the stages. And the crazy thing is, is like two within about two years of working there, he got fired. And he took, but but you watch what he walked away with. He went from zero to twenty five million dollars in less than two years. Like, I don't know if they got some hard feelings. They probably do because the one guy's like, F you, you're going to come back. He's like, no, blah, blah, you F you, I'm never coming back. And he's like, they both think they're, the other one's going to come groveling. And, and, and I mean, good thing is he burned the bridge so that he couldn't go back. Go back, yeah. But as a result, he walked away with the skill set that changed everything. Mm-hmm. So he's 26 years old. He's already... He's already, he, he had already hit multi, multi-million dollars before he was even 26. Wow. And I'm like, like, so if I went back to myself, I'd tell myself, look, stop. Stop. Like, there, you're, there's no value in washing dishes like that. Mm-hmm. There's no value in bagging groceries like that. There's no value in this. You're, you're, you're doing it all wrong. Like, you're, you met the wrong people. So yeah. Stop. Do something different. That would have changed everything for me. Oh, yeah, Definitely. I remember going along with that when I first started construction, not going to lie, have no experience. <laughs> I went in there on an interview. I drove my wife's car there. I took the interview and I, the guy said, are you a concrete finisher? And I said, yeah, have no clue what a concrete finisher is. <laughs> I know it has to do with concrete, but I walked in there to the office, get the interview. They were desperate to hire people. All right, you're on. Start tomorrow. I don't care how you get into the job site, but get there in seven o'clock. So I showed up. I didn't know that they needed uh, tools for, <laughs> as a concrete finisher, you carry your own tools with you all the time. I didn't know. I showed up and everyone's like, so where's your tools? I'm like, I didn't know you were supposed to bring tools. They lent me a set of tools to finish, mm-hmm. right? And the first day I was trying to hide from the foreman because the foreman sees me that I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, probably my last day. But then there's a kid there. He's probably like in the low end of the crew. Yeah. Does the cleanup. He does this. His name is Jose. Okay. I came in and I said, Jose, I have no idea what I'm doing. He's like, but you are hired as a concrete finisher. I know, but I, I need the job. <laughs> so <laughs> help me out here. So here's the kid on the lower end of the crew teaching me how to finish concrete. That's what we're pouring that day. So I got paid that week. I did the same thing. I'd get paid that week and I was like... I think it was midweek that I started. It was 300 bucks. Went home. I told my wife, look, I, I have 300 bucks. They need me to have tools. Can we go buy for the next few weeks if I go buy, use the money to buy tools? And she said, okay, go ahead. So I went into Walmart, you know. Here's me <laughs> with like, Walmart, well, right? all my tools. <laughs> I was getting, you know, tools. Just I thought it was concrete tools. I bought it, bought a, a you know, a, a five-gallon bucket. Put it out. I was so proud of myself. I walk into the to the job site the next week, and the boss looks at me and my tools, and he just shakes his head. <laughs> <laughs> he just shakes his head. Are you doing concrete with that? Those are blaster, um, you know, the, the <laughs> yeah. tools that, you, that I bought. And I was like, I don't care, dude. If it does the job, it does the job. So he was like, go on and start working. So I went that, and then I started accumulating, learned, like, oh, this is the good tool for this. <laughs> And I remember um, one of my good friends uh, were doing running his own business. Yeah. He was very successful. And on the weekends, he's like, hey, if you don't have anything on the weekends, come help me. So I go help him, and I admire how he's doing his work. And I'm like, so 
do you make a lot of money doing all this stuff? And it's like, dude, a lot more money than you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, what? How about, <laughs> hey, wait a minute, hold on. Uh, yeah. So how about this? I I work for you, I work for you for a few months on the weekends. Yeah. You teach me all you know about concrete. Yeah. He's like, okay, all right. So I was I was working full time. I was working for him on the weekends, and some of the weekends that like. I have my own jobs. I do my own thing, you know. But he was one of the guys that I call him for everything. Everybody asks me like, "How do you do this?" I call him out, Sony. How do we do this? And luckily enough, they're good people. Oh yeah. So this is how I do it. He says this is how we, you can do. It. So I learned as I was trying to grow my business, and I found that I'm good at everything, but I am better in talking to people about our service, like the sales part of it. Um. Not the best at sales, but I am always good when I'm walking with the customers to their backyard to show me stuff. I know exactly what I need to say in regards of service of what I'm doing. So I stick to that. I will find work, and if I can't do it, I have my my other friend does it. You know, but I've learned that like I'm very good at that. So I stick with it. I still do the odd and ends of like you know finishing the work, framing, and all that. But what I'm very passionate about is like the sales part of it. Talking to people, and a lot of times people think sales is a. I think sales people. Are, we should all learn sales because we sell I, services, anything, even our kids. I'm trying to sell them. <laughs> you are. You selling the kids? Why? Yeah. You're trying to get a job. Oh, you're trying to. Yeah. Like I don't know where influence doesn't work. No, but it, like sales is like major, and I'm still learning. It. I want to learn more. One thing that I've done with my kids. In, I tell this story a lot. Is、um, when my my girl was three years old, my oldest. She's five now. I would always give her options instead of giving her, "Oh no, you can't do that." I'm like, "Okay, you either have this or this. Which one?" And she does it, and I don't remember who I learned it from, but I always do that with her. Ah, that's a good strategy. Yeah. So instead of saying no to them, I give them options, so she knows. So you either go eat this or eat that. So that way, she there's no in between. So she has she makes a choice because I think a lot in our life we think that we don't have choice. You said、yep. it before, but we have a choice. Yeah, we just have to find、we、what choice, choice that we can do. Now, like if I take her to anywhere the stores, she brings two toys and like that. Should I get this? <laughs> this? Now she's selling you. Now、girl. she's selling to me, <laughs> and it's a good skill that you need to teach the kids because、oh, you know, and later in life it'll be useful because now I have no choice but to buy a toy for them. <laughs> You want this one or that? One? <laughs> you know, even food. She would like say, "Okay, you you want this or this?" So it's a good thing, a good strategy. I think、oh, it's been、girl. helpful. I love it. <laughs> well, man, I bet. What are we?、Yeah. We've been here almost an hour, dude. So if people want to find you, Sioni, where 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 should they go find you? At? Where do you want to be found?、Um, I'm pretty much in Facebook under Xiao Xi Langi. I am on TikTok a lot. You are eighteen thousand、like uh, plus followers. You got a lot on there.、Um, it's Langi underscore twelve, and I'm on Instagram.、Um, and for for your listeners, I'm I'm not professional, but I'm trying to make a difference. We talked before.、Um, we live in a life that I think, with everything that's going on in the world, we need more people that inspire and to help others grow, minds mindset wise. Because if we can't, then we will, we're just letting the world consume us.、Um, dangerous, man. Dangerous, very dangerous. Not everybody, most of them, actually. I mean, strange as it sounds, fifty percent of America only have two point five percent of the wealth. So if you want to, if you want to hang out down there, all you have to do is listen to fifty percent of the people standing around. Yep. Yep. Ten percent on thirty-seven percent. No,、yeah. no, no, no. The top one percent on thirty-seven percent. Yeah, the top ten percent of Americans own seventy percent. Wow! And then you got a little wedge in there for about thirty percent for the top fifty, and then the bottom, the bottom fifty only has two and a half percent of all the wealth. The wealth. And so, yeah, you gotta be careful. Yeah, and I just wanted to invite people to come and tune in to Mike's、uh, podcast. <laughs> I feel like you know we can talk for like you know four or five hours about. Know, things that we learn and experiences, but you know, if you guys tune in to Rags to Riches Secrets. It's a, I'm, de- it's a definitely good listen, right?、Um, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of golden nuggets that you guys will pick up on it, and that's the whole idea of this is that we, we listen, we pick what we know that it's benefits, and it'll help us grow. All right. Very good.
crap. I say it might be crap, man. Just take the nuggets. Take, take the nuggets. Drop yes. the rest. <laughs> All right, bro. Hey, thank Dude. you, brother. Appreciate it, brother. For yeah. The time.